The Hong Kong Shenzhen border is the busiest border in the world. It's in a sense an amazing place because it was just a sleepy fishing village 20, 30 years ago and now it's bustling. I think my first impression, uh, uh, as with everybody who goes to China, especially every Indian who goes to China, uh, was one of astonishment. I'm Amitabh Ghosh. I'm a novelist. I've written several books. And it was Sea of Poppies, really, that first led me to China. As I was working on the book, I realized that there was this very strong uh, link between India and China in terms of maritime trade in the 19th century, between Calcutta and Guangzhou and uh, Bombay and Guangzhou. So I went to Guangzhou and spent a month there. So I went there from actually from New York. I mean, we think of New York as the big uh, sort of city, the big tall city. And you suddenly arrive in a place and you realize that uh, this place can accommodate a hundred New Yorks. Uh, for about 50 miles, you drive through just skyscraper after skyscraper. These amazing um, uh, freeways and motorways. And it was just a sense of astonishment that even though one had read so much already about all that's happened in China in terms of infrastructure. The actual reality of it doesn't strike you until you've actually seen it uh, close up. The surprising thing about China is that it's actually very user-friendly. I mean, it's easier for a stranger to get around China, I think, uh, than for them to get around India. People don't harass you all the time. People don't try and cheat you all the time. So in so many ways, it's actually much easier. And they were always incredibly friendly and nice. And all the restaurants I went to, people were ever so friendly. The first time I went to China um, was when uh, we were in Hong Kong and um, we just uh, snuck over the border to um, Shenzhen. It was a rather shady thing. You took the train, you know, and then you arrived uh, somewhere and then there was like a bus and then, you know, they, they just took you over. In the past, we weren't allowed to go to China because I had a Malaysian passport and uh, there were two countries that we weren't allowed to go to and said in the passport we weren't allowed to go to Israel um, and also to China. It was just the, the curiosity was just the curiosity of seeing China. So I just come back from Seoul and you can, you know, go to this area that's near the demilitarized zone where you can peer over if the weather is good into North Korea. It's just the curiosity of seeing the communist other, um, but also the other who is supposed to be your motherland um, that otherwise you would not have access to. I suppose there is that sense that one is returning to the country of one's ancestral origins um, and you should feel something. Um, but it's when you don't feel something and you are not quite sure why it is that you're not feeling anything. Um, that's when, uh, I guess, the disappointment sets in. My name is Martin Ma. I have been working in the hotel uh, more than 48 years, beginning from 1964. Worked as a page boy. The first time, 19... 1986, I went to Hong Kong to have a train in, 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 in a Hong Kong uh, a Grand Hotel for three months. This is my first time to go outside of, of the mainland. Hong Kong, they has the highway already right, at the time. But Shanghai, no, not that kind of thing. Right. And they, they got a... I, I don't... I haven't found any bicycle in the street, but we have quite a lot here. This is not, not the same, quite different. I think they are quite modern than in Shanghai at the time. About July, June, July 1985, I remember coming into to Guangzhou, to Canton on the train where I was going to get a train up to, to Beijing. And I have vivid memory of people, people everywhere. I had never seen such masses of people. And also memories of the ground beside the railway line all the way from the border. It was being cultivated. People were growing food everywhere. But the great contrast uh, in that, that voyage was that there was nothing to eat. There were no restaurants. 
Where there were restaurants, they were filthy and you had to stand behind somebody and hold on to their chair to make sure that you got the chair and the opportunity to sit down at that table once they'd gone. And I was shocked. I'd spent a year in China, in Taiwan. Every second building, you could get something to eat. So for me, that was the biggest contrast. I'd been from China and I was in this, this strange place. I went to China in 1979 and I was part of the first major cohort of American students to go to China. So we had about 30 or so in our group. We arrived in Hong Kong and we went across the border to Shenzhen and we took the train up to Beijing. I was so excited. We were all so excited. And I, I sat next to the window with the window open looking outside most of the time. And then when I looked in a mirror, I saw that my face was covered with dirt. Um, from the window, from the dirt from the window coming in. Um, and I realized that this was a dusty and dirty place. That didn't really affect me very much. We all were extremely excited. Um, we arrived at Tiananmen and we started cheering. The whole group of us just started cheering. We were so excited. The first time when I went to China was when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Hong Kong. I think I was 13 or 14 at that point when I was in the first set foot in Xinhua in Guangdong province in the hometown of my grandparents. That visit was organized by one of the uh, student societies in Hong Kong. We went to Guangzhou. It was actually like a summer holiday. And then we were going up there to do some performances. I met with you know, some relatives distant you know, relatives of my age. I was uh, playing the Chinese instrument, Perhu. I learned how to swim. I also learned how to go to the paddy field just to do some sort of art culture work. The younger people and the girls were, I think, more interested in those who were playing Western instruments, particularly uh, the guitarist. I think he was extremely popular. The way in which they uh, taught you how to swim was actually thrill you to the pond. <laughs> and then you struggle. We sort of stood out, um, sort of different hairstyle. I think I, 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 I had long hair. The only thing I was not very comfortable was that the, the, they want to take you know, everything from, from us in terms of clothes, in terms of uh, shoes, socks new or old and everything. Even though we were sort of, you know, uh, Chinese, but then uh, the local uh, people would sort of look at us as if we were, you know, strange animals. I was told, you know, by my grandparents, just gave them. We, we were going to, to buy you some new stuff when we were back to Hong Kong. So just gave everything to this bunch of people. Many of us, uh, were really very curious and, and we felt that this we are sort of going to you know, our own country. I grew up in Hong Kong in a you know, cosmopolitan kind of style. Somehow, suddenly, you were in uh, a village, in a kind of typical village. So there's still that sort of excitement about, okay, you know, this is the motherland. Just to mingle with them, uh, to live you know, with these uh, village people. My interest in China generated my interest in sort of politics in general uh, because of that sort of semi-mysterious nature of this sort of country, which is sort of my country, but somehow, you know, uh, we, we are sort of separated by this uh, sort of Lawu River, and then I was in a, a city uh, ruled by the British. And I first went to China in September of 1973 um, as part of the first group of British students. When we got there, there was one Kuwaiti, five Cambodians, three Japanese, and three Tanzanians. And that was it. That was pretty much the foreign student body of Beijing. It's hard to convey what a separate world China was in those days. But of course, arrival and departure are those moments. I always arrived by plane, but I left across that little wooden bridge at Luowu. I think coming out of China, it would be surprising if you didn't have a 
kind of re-entry shock. I remember being very shocked actually, particularly in Hong Kong. You first get to Hong Kong, which of course is kind of temple to mammon, um, and you'd walk into a shop and there would be racks and racks and racks of clothing. And every little purchase you made would come in a plastic bag. I'd had two plastic bags on me when I first went to China. And I had hoarded them and used them for two years till they actually crumbled away. And, and the shock and the sense of waste and, and the sense of just surfeit of material goods, I just couldn't deal with it at all. And I certainly couldn't buy anything. It was just too much. It's quite rare, I think, in the modern world that you do cross a frontier with that sense of, crossing a border here that is more than just a physical border. I am Christopher Hum. Uh, I worked in the British Foreign Office for uh, getting on for 40 years. My last job in the Foreign Office was as Ambassador in Beijing. Well, my name is Harold Buckman and uh, I'm a Norwegian China scholar. And my first visit to China was in 1970. I first went to China in the fall of 1970. I was um, a very junior member of the commercial section of the Office of the British Chargé d'Affaires. Uh, this was a uh, group of young socialists, or rather one could say Maoists. Uh, these were times when China had more or less cut itself off from the world. It was a study tour to study the victories of the Cultural Revolution. There were very few ways into China. Uh, the only way the foreigners took was by train from Kowloon. To the border, there's a river called Lobo, and there's a bridge, and this has become a very symbolic crossing. And of course, everyone got off the train except those who were actually going over. And we picked up our cases, and we walked across a rather narrow bridge. There was the fluttering Union Jack. There was the Gurkha sentry, then on the other side, there was the PLA sentry, the fluttering Chinese flag. You know, you enter from the colony into the uh, cultural revolutionary utopia. And there was only one building on the other side. We're talking about a place now known as Shenzhen, a population of 10 million. There were a few houses there, so enough so you could change trains. And that was it. And I think I should add that there were three people on that train. I never discovered who the other two were because they were um, superior to me in the diplomatic uh, pecking order. They were, I think, Tanzanians. And so they were taken to a different waiting room. They were placed at a different table for lunch. They were given a different lunch from me. So I was given sort of the second class treatment as befitted a, a Westerner. The way I remember it, I think we, we, had, we got a lunch. We got an excellent lunch. And I remember looking out of the window of the railway station as I waited for my train. And there was almost total silence. It was an entirely rural view, paddy fields all the way around, a little group of peasants uh, planting out the paddy in the distance. And there was just a little village I could see, and the tinny sound of a, of a uh, loudspeaker playing revolutionary music. And somehow that sort of summed up everything about China at that time to me. Very poor, largely rural, uh, very isolated, very revolutionary. There was no tourism, right? There was no businesses, uh, except for once a year when people went to the, uh, to the fair in Guangzhou, uh, which was in the fall. So um, it was a symbolic trip, but it was rather nothing spectacular. And that was the only train that went to the border that day. Uh, and I believe that means that we were the only three people entering the People's Republic of China on that particular day in 1970.